Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. We've heard these words in this Sunday's Gospel. Jesus here is talking about the cost of discipleship, the cost of following Jesus. In, at all times in human history, following Jesus, proclaiming the gospel with your life is going to cost. Because at all times in human history, the gospel is countercultural. It goes against the grain. It's teaching something different. Today, yesterday, was September 11th. And uh, a number of us in the Jesuit community at Creighton were sitting around the lunch table and recalling where we were 20 years ago yesterday. And of course, everyone could remember. Some guys were in Europe, some were at Creighton here. Uh, other people were different places. Um, all of you in this church, if you're of age, uh, you know exactly, likely, where you were on September 11th, 2001, when this horrific event kept unfolding and getting worse and more involved and more destructive. We know, of course, about the, the firefighters, uh, over 300 of them who lost their lives, uh, police officers, uh, other people who volunteered, uh, people who were not public servants at all, who just sprung into action. Uh, so many uh, that day uh, sprung into action um, without regard to their own safety. They just sprung into action. And As I reflect on that, these people that put themselves in harm's way, for people they didn't even know many times, uh, and all divides seemed to go away. All of a sudden there were no racial divides, there were no socioeconomic divides, there were no uh, cultural divides or anything. People were just people. Uh, we were left with our humanity, our human dignity, and people just began to help and many put their lives in harm's way. I don't think that happens, that spontaneous, obviously what happened that day, people sprung into action spontaneously. But I think for those people who did that, I don't think that they, they did that just without any preparation. I think most of the people, the firefighters, the police uh, men and women, uh, other types of first responders, paramedics, uh, other people who just tried to help out in any way they could, that put themselves in harm's way. They, the preparation for that is sort of their faith, uh, their, their natural tendency to love, to do just what Jesus, the central mission, message of the Gospel is to love, to love one another. And when we look at uh, the central message of Jesus Christ, um, which is represented in the, in the great commandment in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where Jesus uh, combines uh, love your neighbor, love God above all things from Deuteronomy and from the uh, book of Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself, and he combines those two into the great commandment, to love one another as I have loved you. And Jesus, when asked about this, says that all of the revelation of God up until that point, everything that the prophets taught, um, 
everything from the, the, the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law, um, all this revelation of God could be summed up in this great commandment to love God above all things and to love your neighbor as yourself. And we know that you cannot separate those. You cannot separate the great commandment. You cannot claim to love God and not love your neighbor. And to the extent that you're not loving your neighbor, you're not loving God. In the fourth gospel, in John's gospel, we have something similar. We have the great love command. Uh, to, and Jesus says, this is my command, to love one another as I have loved you. So this is the very command of God, uh, the very message, the heart of the gospel is to love. And, and it's no wonder because this is what God is. God is love and we know that love always looks outward. Love looks outward. It doesn't look toward ourselves. Love looks outward. And, and the very nature of God is to love. And, and you, you know, why does anything exist rather than nothing? Why does anything exist? And we look at the, the great order of the universe and the solar system and our planet Earth and the uh, weather systems, uh, plant and animal systems, uh, the great complexity and order and everything. And it's all created. And at the very apex of this is the human person, you and I. Um, and, and we're given this beautiful gift of free will and we have this beautiful gift of, full fr of freedom and, and, and it's such a beautiful gift it's misused obviously many times and, and it's, it's the whole idea of the incarnation of God coming among us to, to help us you know this is a God who not only creates us and puts out a love and puts us at the very apex of all creation. But this is a God who is constantly, through salvation history, reaching out to us, reaching out through the prophets, Abraham, uh, Isaac, uh, uh, Moses, uh, to reach out to us, to communicate with us, because this is a God who wants a relationship with us. And isn't that, again, the very nature of love? God wants to love each and every one of us all through human history. Uh, so this is a God that's reaching out to us. And, and in our inability to, to live and flourish well, to love appropriately, we get the whole incarnation, this God becoming human while still remaining God in the person of Jesus Christ, um, who teaches us by his word and his action how to live and how to love one another, how to love God and how to love one another. And, and in a, of course, Jesus eventually suffers and dies and rises from the dead, this whole Paschal mystery, which gives us all a chance for eternal life, the great wonderful gift of eternal life. This is a God who loves, and this is a God who wants us to love. And in following this God, and following Jesus, this God who's come among us, is going to be costly. It's going to cost. And that's what Jesus is talking about in the Gospel here. Whoever wishes to come after me, in other words, who's following me, whoever wishes to follow me must deny himself, take up his cross, take up the cross that comes with that, and to follow. And, uh, and of course, this is what Jesus does. He's there at the will of the Father to come among us. As St. Paul says, to pitch his tent among us, to enter into our chaos, and to, to accompany us, to enter into our chaos, teach us how to live, suffer, die for us. Uh, and how does Jesus do this? Well, he's God. And, uh, and this is written about so beautifully hundreds of years before Jesus is born in our first reading today from the prophet Isaiah and, and how Jesus would suffer. And this is a a, uh, a foretaste or a foreshadowing of the suffering that Jesus would do. I give my back to those who beat me, my, my cheek to those who pluck my beard, my face I did not shield, 
from buffets and spitting. The Lord God is my help. Therefore, I am not disgraced. And uh, so this is how Jesus does this. He has this wonderful prayer life, this wonderful relationship with the Father that strengthens him to, to come among us, to teach us, uh, and to, to basically to suffer eventually and die for us. It's all strengthened by his relationship with the Father. I think that people of 9-11, um, the people who responded so generously, uh, who paid this ultimate price, there's a, this is the cost of discipleship, the cost of being a person who loves and looks outward and wants the best for other people uh, and is willing to lay down one's life for one's friends. And Jesus tells us, no greater love is there than one who lays down his life for one's friends. And uh, so these people um, who laid down their life, I think a lot of them had this foundation of love, of looking outward, looking toward the other. And, uh, and I was reflecting last night, there was a lot of stuff on 9-11 on the news and in the, in the uh, History Channel and different things. I'm sure many of you watched it. And, and we saw this, um, this, the one flight that went to, uh, got as far as Ohio and then, so it was in, in the air the longest and this, people were able to communicate with family and find out what was really going to happen to their flight too. And, uh, and they hatched this plan to, uh, to try to take back the flight uh, to, pres- you know, to basically to preserve lives hopefully their own, but even if not their own, certainly the lives of others, as this plane would be, probably head back to Washington. And, and I read the transcripts of that, this fellow, I think his name is Todd Beamer, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, in his transcript of his communication with the, 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 the operator he was talking to, and he told them what they were, was happening and what, they were, what the, uh, this group of passengers was going to attempt to do. And, but in that, he asked the operator he's talking to, uh, would you pray with me? Would you pray with me? And in that transcript, and you can look at it, they pray the Our Father, and they pray the 23rd Psalm. So this, this man was a man of faith. And, uh, and I think it's just beautiful to see this, this, this stance of love, of loving others that prepared people for, for this horrible day when, when they, so many would put their lives in harm's way and, and, and a good number would die. But it, it's that stance, it's that cost of discipleship. And I think that's what Jesus is talking about in the Gospel. And, and if we look at this letter from St. James, our second reading today, uh, St. James talks about uh, faith that, that does not have works is dead. Faith that does not have works is dead. In other words, in my experience, and and all of you, I'm sure you can reflect on this, that people of faith, when you have faith, when your faith is going, it naturally leads, it spontaneously leads to good works. And and something to think about. When people have faith and when their faith is going, and if you watch someone who has faith or is, is beginning to develop their faith, you can just see these good works just spontaneously begin to, to come out. And uh, so it's so true uh, that, that our faith spontaneously um, urges us on to do good works. And, uh, and I'm sure many of you, of course, are aware of that and you reflect on that. It's a very beautiful thing. And, uh, but there's a cost, isn't there? There can be a cost. And that's what Jesus is talking about, this cost of discipleship. Um, again, his own followers, initially 2,000 years ago, the apostles who followed him, 11 of the 12 were martyred eventually. Um, for their, uh, prop- you know, for following Jesus, essentially. Uh, St. Paul was martyred eventually. The greatest preacher in human history uh, paid the ultimate price, the cost of discipleship. And uh, so, uh, and many people through human history have paid, uh, sure, martyrdom certainly, but, but even less. Uh, you know, it's the cost of discipleship. There's cost for each one of us. Uh, to following the Lord, to love, uh, to love one another, uh, uh, 
in the way that Jesus calls us to live, uh, whether we're married or single, family life, uh, how, do we, how are we as brother, sister, parent, spouse, co-worker, friend, son, daughter, grandparent, uh, all the ways that we're called to live and to love. And it's not always easy, and then there's a cost to it, and, uh, but it's a wonderful thing, and, and it's what we're called to do. It's what Jesus does himself. It's what faithful Christians have done all through human history, to love and to look out for one another. And, uh, and even though there's a cost, and uh, there's the resurrection, of course, and the, ultimately we are all called to human to eternal life. And this is the, the great gift, the ultimate gift, of course, is, is eternal life to be happy with God forever. And that's the, the ultimate gift, and that's what we get from the, res the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And, uh, and that is the ultimate wonderful thing. That is the ultimate uh, good news of the gospel.